I want to now shift the gears a little bit and talk about reparations to Black Americans. It's a big issue, and I'm against it. I want to just give some flavor of what it is that I'm concerned about, which I think will reveal something of my larger outlook. I'm against it for a couple of reasons. First, I will note that when the Japanese Americans who had been interred by the Roosevelt administration during World War II were finally in an act of Congress signed into law by Ronald Reagan, officially acknowledged to have been wrongly victimized, they were offered a token reparations payment. It was $20,000 a head, and it went out to 80,000 people, people who had actually been interred in camps. That's $1.6 billion paid out of the U.S. Treasury as well it should have been paid. By contrast, there are 35 to 40 million African Americans. If we take 40 acres and a mule as a benchmark and we bring it forward at a normal rate of return, we're in the many tens of thousands of dollars per head. Call it 100,000 a head, that's $4 trillion. That is, we have 40 million people receiving $4 trillion as compared with 80,000 people receiving $1.6 billion. Here's my point. To pay reparations to Black Americans would require creating a social security magnitude fiscal program in America based upon racial identity. That is a mistake for this society. It's South Africa-esque. It would mean classifying people, enacting statutes, laws, and administrative practices based upon a citizen's race. America ought not to go down that path, even if the courts would allow it, about which I have my severe doubts. Of course, people are going to differ with that opinion, but such is the moral argument that I'd like to make. But I also have a practical argument about reparations, which is that African Americans do have a problem, do have many problems in some of our communities, for sure. We could enumerate them. I've already hinted at that. These problems are going to be with us for a while. They won't be going away overnight, and they appropriately deserve a sympathetic engagement by the polity as a whole. Dealing with these problems, which I admit are in part a consequence of our history of slavery and Jim Crow, will require an open-ended commitment. So in my view, it would not be the smartest thing in the world to cash our position out, so to speak, via transaction wherein Black people sit on one side of the metaphorical bargaining table with our moral capital and America is on the other side of that table. And a transaction is in effect negotiated by means of which this debt is discharged. I do not want to commodify that tacit obligation. Rather, I would argue what we should do is take our chips and put them with the larger political initiatives that are aimed at creating a decent society here in the United States for everyone, whether that be on behalf of healthcare or housing or food security or employment or preschool education or old age security and so forth. I'm talking here about building out the American welfare state. Were it sufficiently robust on behalf of everybody, most of the concerns that we have about racial disparities would be ameliorated, and we Blacks will have lent our moral capital to a righteous cause, not a racially defined reparation, but instead a humanistically defined improvement in the social contract broadly understood. Now, having gotten myself into hot water enough, I think I'll say a few words about affirmative action. Because the court is going to be hearing these cases in the current term, and we'll see what the court decides. But I will observe that we're 50 years down the line with these policies, a half century. It's a long time. Racial preferences have become institutionalized. And that causes me to have a concern. And let me just voice it directly. Equality of representation in the most rarefied venues of competitive selection is ultimately inconsistent with equality of respect when there are different performance levels between the populations in question. I'm talking about selection at the right tail, not talking about selection at the median of a population. I'm talking about the 95th percentile. 
My point is that there's going to be a post-selection difference in performance of students by race if one has used different pre-selection criteria when choosing them, so long as those pre-selection criteria actually correlate with post-selection performance. If these criteria, standardized tests, let's say, previous grades, advanced placement enrollments, quality of a writing sample or whatever, if these indicia of qualification are not correlated with performance, then they should not be used at all when they have a disparate impact on a historically disadvantaged group. But presumably such criteria are being used precisely because we all know that they are in fact correlated with post-performance to some degree. That's why we use them to select among applicants who are all in the same racial group because we're looking for those who are the most promising applicants and because the criteria in question are the best information we have about that question. The context, if a graduate education, perhaps we're talking about the GREQ, if an undergraduate education, perhaps, perhaps we're talking about the SAT verbal. The context may vary. Uh, it won't be the same everywhere. But the criteria in question, to the extent that they are correlated, tell us something about how those being selected will perform after the fact. Now, if you use different cutoffs, and I invite you to look at the data produced in Discovery in the Harvard case, for example, to see the huge disparities in the indices of academic preparation characteristic of applicant populations by race to that university. That's just one window on this reality. It's somewhat opaque because institutions are not forthcoming with their data. We have different criteria of selection. they are going to be different post-selection performance if the criteria are correlated. These are large samples. This is the law of large numbers. It's inescapable. What's the consequence of that? We're in the right tail now. Remember, we're selecting elites. The consequence of using racial preferences to promote representation of the disadvantaged in venues of high selectivity, I claim, is that either we acknowledge these differences in post-admissions performance or we don't. We cover them up by flattening our assessment criteria. We pretend that they're not there. This dishonesty can be stifling. My claim is that right tail selection plus racially preferential selection is ultimately inconsistent with true racial equality. It'll get you representation, but it will not get you to true equality. That is to an equality of dignity, of respect, of standing, of belonging. You need something closely approximating parity of performance to get that kind of equality. But you've selected with racially differential standards into an activity which is highly competitive and elite where it is known in advance that the criteria are correlated with post-selection performance. As a result, you end up with racial disparities in performance after selection that you don't own up to. Thus, consider academic economics. There are not enough black economists, I agree. We should be diverse and inclusive, I agree. Of the top 20 departments in the country, there should be at least two at every one of them. Okay, I'll agree to that. And they're not, we gotta do better. I agree to that. Maybe I can agree with all of that, but if the way you're going to do better is to make criteria of selection into this rarefied enterprise of academic economics at the frontier in the top departments, dependent upon racial identity, you're not going to get equality. What you're going to get is Black mediocrity to some degree. 